Hey, welcome everyone to Science Yoga Sunday. This is our third ever uh, episode of the series. And I know we have a blend of yoga teachers and yoga students and people are just curious about yoga in general that are either watching this live or watching the replay. So I'll just give you guys a, a really quick overview of what Science Yoga Sunday is if you've never watched this chat before. Um, first of all, my name is Julie and I'm from LA and SF, but I'm currently in Santorini, Greece. And I have the amazing Dr. Ariel Foster from DC, who's here to join us today. So say hi, Ariel. Hey everyone, I'm Ariel. Awesome. So you're in the right place if you're wanting to learn about yoga or you've been practicing yoga for a while. And with, with the way that Eastern traditional yoga has come from and the way that modern Western science is coming from, there's this need, there's this growing need to bridge the gap between both worlds. So that way we can have a really safe and healthy yoga practice and also still be able to enjoy the other benefits of yoga if you're into the spiritual aspect or if it just makes you feel really good and helps your mind be really calm. And in the previous Science Yoga Sunday episodes, we've shared PowerPoint slides and diagrams and pictures of the muscles and the bone structure and talking about how to understand the structure of the body, the anatomy, and the way it works. And this time around, we're not going to do PowerPoint slides. We're not going to do pictures. We're going to have a really candid chat. And um, the topic for today is, do the yoga poses serve us, or do we serve the yoga poses? And I'm really excited to chat with Ariel today because not only has she been teaching for, I believe, almost a decade or more than a decade, but she 16 has a, years. Well, that's way more than a decade, 16 years. <laughs> um, you also, you have a doctorate in physical therapy, right? Yeah. So I think this is a good, uh, good segue to get to know Ariel. Like, let's hear about your background and, and how you came about with yoga and how you brought the physical therapy world and yoga together to where you are mm -hmm. right now. Sure, thank you so much for having me on, Julius. It's just such a, a sweet treat to be able to be here. Um, so, all right, so I started teaching yoga fresh out of college. I didn't have a particularly athletic background, but when I was in undergrad, I was exposed to Kripalu yoga, and I completely, utterly fell in love with it. Kripalu yoga is a very um, non-dogmatic, uh, it can be very gentle, but it can be more challenging style of yoga that um, has three main like, stages. So the first stage would be uh, just this willful showing up stage that like it takes a little bit of effort to roll out your yoga mat to show up and do the poses. And that's why yoga teachers are so very helpful because they teach us, you know, what to do. The second stage would be sort of a, you might um, embody it by holding a pose for a long time and working through like a five minute hold of goddess pose or something, working through all of the stuff that comes up. This isn't mandatory, of course, it's not a very dogmatic style. And then the third stage would be meditation in motion. So I come from this really like soft, fluid yoga background, but then when I moved to Washington DC, soon after that, in 2001, I realized that, I, I mean, I really fell in love with vinyasa yoga. Um, I loved the dance, the music, the hype. It was it was a great compliment to having, at the time I worked in like environmental policy and activism. So I had kind of desk jobs where I was sitting a lot on the computer a lot. And then I would go and practice or teach this very flow-based classes. About five years in, maybe four, I went to class one night and I 
it was a, a reasonable class. It was an Iyengar based class. It wasn't even a flow class that night. But I remember we were holding down dog for a long time. And I remember distinctly, I was in my mid 20s. It was like, I was around age 25. And I wanted to get out of the pose. We were in it for so long. And I was a little uncomfortable. But I was too shy. I didn't feel like um, I remember I had some of some of the people who were my students in the class as well. And I was being a student and I didn't want my students to think that I was, you know, there was some ego there. Um, so I didn't want to like cop out and jump out of the pose. And the next day I couldn't lift my arm. So I went to see a physical therapist about a week or two, let's say a few days later. And she did like some really simple quick tests and she knew within about five minutes what was going on for me, which was a rotator cuff injury. that was really clearly from repetitive stress of vinyasa, of mm -hmm. chaturanga, of um, upward, probably the process of chaturanga to up dog to down dog over and over again. And really not having the fundamental stability, not just strength, but fundamental stability in the joints to do all of those things. So, that was let's call that 2005 2006 and i ended up going back to school for a year and a half for prerequisites and then for three years for my doctorate of physical therapy in the us anyway it's a, it's now a clinical doctorate degree so i'm not a phd i'm not an md i have a dpt um, but it's year round so it's more intensive even than law school we dissected uh, cadavers for, I think, the first eight weeks of school, literally every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, two hour lecture, four hours in the lab, <coughs> dissection. So um, today I am about six, seven years out of physical therapy school. And today I uh, see patients twice a week at Georgetown University Hospital. I see private patients twice a week at my own clinic. I teach yoga classes. I run retreats and I run an online yoga anatomy mentorship called yoganatomyacademy.com. Actually, that's just my general website, yoganatomyacademy.com. So that is what puts me here today. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um. That's, uh, you know, that's interesting when you talked about being the student in the room and not wanting to be that one student that's quote unquote caving in or showing signs of a weakness that you're not following what the teacher is saying. Because mm -hmm. when I was starting off as a student, I, I'm a teacher as well, and I started off as a student for about five years, and there were quite a few classes where the teacher was having us in plank for maybe two minutes at least, or just, you know, the power yoga style where you're in a pose for a really, really long time. And you see people hesitating and resting on their knees. And you're like, well, if, I, if I'm not strong enough, that must mean I'm not a yogi or, you know, like that whole internal struggle and conflict of, the challenge, the needing to be at a certain level in order to feel like we're really doing the yoga. So, and this to know that you had a rotator cuff injury after. Do you, how long did that? How, how long did it take to to recover from that injury? Well, it got let's say it got ninety five percent better within a couple of months. Um, it's something I still have to take care of and and treat sweetly and baby, and I know a lot more about it now, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, I it, it was a really profound experience that shifted my life. And I think even this conversation around like that being a level of yoga is we have to really root out all the ways in which we um, inadvertently diminish the the broader experience so let me give an example um i think that the highest level of yoga in that moment would have been to say this doesn't feel good i'm going to step down from this and i'm going to take a break and i'm going to listen to this internal teacher because the ultimate goal of our yoga practice is really this process of self-inquiry it's really the process of um 
discipline, but not discipline to an external, uh, some random teacher, right? Like that's not what we're um, building discipline for. We're building discipline for life. We're building uh, tapas and austerity and a, a quality of introspection that should serve us off the yoga mat. It's called practice for a reason. It's not performance. And so the highest level of practice that day would have been to um, to really do some self-inquiry around maybe the reality that probably wasn't strong enough to continue that practice or that I, the reality that I had done uh, a lot of down dogs that week or a lot of chaturangas that week and that I really didn't need more than that. So that's kind of partly what fuels my passion for, for showing up today and fuels this passion of uh, the idea that, you know, are we showing up to the yoga mat to serve our lives? Or are we showing up to the yoga mat to serve these poses? So that was an instance where I am pretty sure I was serving the pose or I was serving the teacher in front of me, which was not really the highest long-term. It was a lesson that clearly I needed to learn. So here I am. What would you, what would you say to a student in terms of because, you know, when I've taught in the studio, there usually a student seems to just follow along with whatever cues being given, even if mm -hmm. I can visually see that the student is struggling. And when I say that, I, I'm seeing their limbs trembling, shaking, mm -hmm. you know, especially uh, if, if they're inside playing fascistasana. And as a teacher, seeing that, and giving the student a cue, you have the option to do this, and you have the option to do this. Um, what would you say to the typical student about owning our choice and owning our power and listening to our bodies versus just doing what the teacher is cueing? Yeah, well, I have, I have two things to say around that. So, um, so the first one, is going to be physiological. So talking about the shaking of the muscle and the second one is going to be more philosophical. All right. So the fact that somebody's muscles are shaking inside plank doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So if it's, if, if they're doing it over and over again, if it was like the 20th side plank of the class, then I might um, really encourage somebody, I, I, I might give an actual instruction, say like, if you're noticing that your shoulder is shaking, that's a sign that you're maxed out. And therefore, please put your knee down. Um, you will thank me tomorrow if you do that. Um, if you, or you will not think about it tomorrow if you do that, which is even better. Like if you don't have to think about this class ever again, great. I'm still thinking about a class from, you know, uh, 12 years ago or something. So if you if you don't have to think about it, then, then the class has done its job. Um, so just going into a side plank or a challenging pose and experience shaking is, is okay. If you went to the gym and you picked up uh, the heaviest weight you could possibly pick up, you'd probably be trembling a little bit. So it's just a natural muscular response to your maximum load. And if we are each of us exposing ourselves to a variety of different movements, a variety of different um, load patterns, like what we're taking on, then hopefully at some point we'll go to our maximum because I for sure know that we're all going to our minimum every day at some point, right? Um, and so I'm not so worried about like a one-off kind of shaking thing. The greater philosophical thing that happens here is, is probably gonna come across as potentially a little bit controversial, but when I first got my doctorate in physical therapy and I first started teaching and I, I think I was trying to like establish myself as um, a try, trying to find how to best fit into these two worlds because I hear a lot of people tell me that physical therapy and yoga have so much overlap and I'm here to tell you that um, not so much in a lot of ways. I mean, the academic process of becoming a physical therapist absolutely completely different. The, the reality of having a career that is governed by a licensing process where you could lose your licensure, so you have a lot at stake, a lot on the line, is a 
fundamentally just profoundly different experience than being like a 200 hour part-time yoga teacher. You know, there's nothing wrong with being a 200 hour part-time yoga teacher. That was literally me for many years, but it's, um, it's, it's different. So I'm showing up, I'm trying to navigate how to fit these two worlds together, right? And how to like establish myself as some kind of, you know, niche expert, something, something. So I'm asking every single class, uh, please tell me about your injuries. Please tell me blah, blah, blah. This is before class starts. And what I noticed over the year and a half or so that I did that regularly, like very, very consistently was this pattern that there were sometimes things that people would tell me that I would have an immediate answer to, that probably most yoga teachers would have an immediate answer to. So let's say like, oh, I'm getting a lot of wrist pain when I do vinyasa. So, okay, well, let's fold up a blanket. Let's put it here. Let's fold your yoga mat. Let's get the wrist wedge if you have happen to have them in the studio. Um, get a second yoga mat and sort of create a little ledge. It's just, there's a million ideas, right? So there were things that I could address right away. There were things that I was like, uh, Okay, I'm not really sure you should be here right now, um, but you know, not trying to dismiss people from their own experience. And then there was this third category of people who just like wouldn't even tell me. Like partway through class, I'd walk over and say, "Is everything okay? Is there anything you know going on?" Oh well, I have this big surgery. I had this big surgery three months ago, and I just you know, I'm like, "Oh well, I asked in the beginning." <laughs> And sometimes people, it would be because they showed up late, but a lot of times it was just like they didn't think it was relevant. Um, and something kind of flipped in my brain after about a year and a half. Like I said, we have a, a lot on the line when you have a, a health license. And I realized that I was putting myself in a position of authority in the context of a group yoga class to try and um, address someone's deep injury. And I think that that is fine if you are a yoga teacher without a health license, without any kind of medical licensure, and you want to really explore, like it's a great way to practice exploring um, uh, modifications and really understanding how injury shows up on the yoga mat. Because if three people tell you, well, I had a, a, a meniscal repair six months ago, three people tell you that over the course of a year, then you're gonna start to see some patterns, like whether there's tenderness, whether there's this, whether there's that. So you'll, you, can, you can learn a lot from that process. But what I started to realize was I was putting myself probably in a really vulnerable position where people would expect me to be able to modify a group yoga class based on their injury. and most of the time that's just not okay that's just not possible because um you know the the process from a physical therapy point of view would be that i would i would first ev like do a complete physical evaluation and then i would figure out what someone is capable of and what their limitations are so i stopped asking about injuries i know it sounds a little wild but i think i actually like would be putting myself in a more vulnerable uh, position by asking about that. So that somehow cycles back to the shakiness and that maxing out in side plank. So I, I, I will often say something along the lines, this is the, the verbal language, the cueing that I would give, would be around the level of like, you know, you're here for practice, you're not here for performance. Please don't do this for me. Please show up and listen to the teacher within. We will assume that there is some uh, weight, some quality of yoga, the essence of yoga that hopefully I'm conveying. Thank you to all of my teachers. And that there's also some individual weight from my words who are in front of you. But we have these three teachers in the room, the one within, the one uh, that is visible, and the one that is invisible, this lineage of the practice. I'm just feeling really relaxed hearing you speak. So <laughs> I can imagine being in your class and, and hearing you say these exact words and having me feel at ease with my practice. So I just wanted to compliment you on that. And uh, oh, I, I also wanted to touch upon two things that you brought up. And one is about speaking about things that may be controversial in the yoga world. And I say controversial as well because 
there's a lot of students and teachers who are very dedicated to the lineage that they've studied yoga with. And then there's a growing movement of teachers and hopefully students that start to ask questions about whether a yoga pose is helping this student out with their functional movement of being able to walk up and down the stairs, being able to get up from a sitting position. Um, where do you where do you see the direction of yoga going in relation to what you've experienced and what you're seeing so far? So I can speak to, to my classes and to my practice. My practice over the last five years has become significantly more strength-based and significantly less about range of motion. Um, I'm really like academically and just personally interested in the topic of hypermobility. I don't think that I personally fall into a, a big category of like, I don't personally fall into a really neat category of uh, generalized hypermobility syndrome. But most yoga practitioners, most yoga teachers have some level of hypermobility somewhere in their body. So I've, I've seen this pattern really, really powerfully across Washington, DC, where I live, where I've been teaching for 16 years. And I see this pattern, you know, all, all over in my teacher trainings and um, in everything. So that's just a side plug. I, I run a Facebook group called Yoga for Those with Hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Ehlers-Danlos is a syndrome that can have hypermobility as a component to it, often does, almost always does. So anyway, so um, when we see these patterns of people showing up to the mat who have generally really like lax body types, these are the folks who truly, truly need strength, like very fundamentally need strength. And if we just use the range of motion as it shows up, not only will it be too easy for them, but it could actually be really, really harmful for them. I think that it's it's incredibly dangerous right now that we are such a visual creatures. Um, it's in, some of the images on, mm, Instagram. on, on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love Instagram. I actually really adore Instagram. I have a lot of fun. It's a creative outlet for me. But I have, um, I've noticed that, that a lot of the people who seem to have risen to Instagram fame in terms of the yoga world, uh, the niche yoga world, they are either naturally really hypermobile to an extent that it could be extremely dangerous for their underlying skeletal structure. I'm talking like people who are probably going to need hip replacements by the time they're 40. Um, one individual I know of on Instagram uh, had some extreme wrist injury from constant handstands. And that's also the, the injury came from a lack of circulation, which is also a sign of an underlying hypermobility disorder. And if you look at many of these uh, Instagram accounts that have skyrocketed to fame, that they're, they're really pushing the flexibility, the contortionist component of yoga. And so, you know, if your body is very easily capable of that, I'm not necessarily going to diminish your practice, but you know, many of the many, many of the dangers of yoga, and this is going back to like our main subject here, happen not from a one-off thing, happen not from like a year of practice, but they're really coming about after years of practice. And so you might start this when you're 21, but when you're 27, 28, 29, 30, dealing with like really, really significant repetitive um, motion injuries. And yeah, I mean, so my own practice has become much, much more strength-based. It's helped me really profoundly. I almost always will start uh, anything other than a gentle class with some deep core work where we re like really just practice recruiting these muscles on our backs on the floor so that when we stand up, that, that we have more like neuromuscular control of them. We can access them a little bit better. Um, and it's become a lot more functional. So one of the things I teach in many, many of my classes, which I never did before becoming a physical therapist, was literally just like how to get on and off the floor. 
I taught a yoga fundamentals class last Thursday, and I'd say probably a third of the class, we were practicing different kneeling techniques, different ways to transition from sitting to standing without using our hands. And it is, um, we should be embarrassed as a yoga community, forgive me, there's no shoulds in the world, right? But we maybe like, could consider a little self introspection around like looking around the room. I'm shocked when people show up to my, um, I'm about to teach this morning a core flow class at 1030 Eastern. And you will be surprised how many people just cannot, um, cannot get up off the floor without using their hands. In a core flow level two class at this particular studio, that's one of the, the highest levels, quote unquote, that shows up. Yeah, and I, I feel it's it's my sacred duty to remind us of, of the real reason we're here. We're here to enhance our lives. We're not here to um, bow down to some set sequence of poses. Really, really important to me at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sighing silently to myself because I, I'm on the same wavelength. And after teaching for a couple of years just the same sequence or just this dogmatic way of instruction yeah. and experiencing my my own personal injuries from just doing the vinyasa yoga i mean i have a, a slight impingement in my left shoulder it still clicks to this day and it, it's a humbling experience to to realize that there is no one specific way to go about our health and our well-being and our livelihood. I mean, it, it's it's incorporating other activities now. It's it's hiking, it's doing some form of strength training, doing a little of Pilates, just a little bit of everything, and mm -hmm. no longer claiming that you just need to do yoga because that in and of itself is an imbalance which is Absolutely. contradicting what yoga is about, which is balance. So mm -hmm. it, it's really it, it's really great to hear you know, the direction that you're taking. And, and I think that the more experience that you have and the more, the more of a solid background that you have on physical therapy or some other parts of the human anatomy, I, it's crazy how the yoga certification process doesn't, it doesn't seem to have that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and just a side note for any of you guys that are watching that your students and you love watching, looking at Instagram and you love admiring those uh, famous Instagram yoga yogis, yoginis, um, Definitely not telling you guys to stop enjoying that. Please, please enjoy exploring and seeing the artistic side of yoga. But again, the purpose of this chat, this really, really real heart to heart chat is for you to start considering that it's okay if your body doesn't look like that. If your pose doesn't look like that person's pose, that your own anatomical structure and, and your own awareness of your strengths and weaknesses is really what would have you personalize your yoga practice for you, no matter what it looks like in a picture. And I also love using Instagram as well. It is a great, it is a great way to express artistry. Um, but again, just take what, take parts of this conversation that work for you and, and, and leave what doesn't. But at least we, we start having this dialogue so that way you can keep yourself as safe as possible. Um, I'll get off that soapbox <laughs> for now. Yeah, so I think when we are like in a yoga class or in a training, there's there's this compressed time period, right? Whether it's the one hour, hour and a half, or like the 10 day training or whatever it is, where we, um, we feel like a need to come out the other end somehow shifted, right? Somehow different, somehow better. And I think um, I think that the, the real thing to remember here is that we're in it for the long haul. We're in it to be sustainable. So if you are like, like a, what just came to mind was the analogy of like a Hollywood actress, right? So if you are, if you 
arrive in Hollywood in your 20s and you end up blowing up, getting real big. And um, and a lot of that is based on qualities such as your looks, such as your capacity, you know, your, your figure, such as um, like the fact that there's no wrinkles in your face just yet. You, you might want to actually develop some acting skills. You might want to develop some production skills. You might want to develop some dire directorial skills or somehow think of some strategy to make your finances last for your life, if not your career last for the entirety of your life. And, you know, like, like the, the hope would be that you don't just become forgotten at age 30, right? And I think the same thing is true of yoga. When you first get to the mat, you can do a repetitive practice. You can do a repetitive practice for maybe five years, 10 years, maybe even 15 or 20 years, but there's going to be a point. So where all of us are going to be facing a different body, literally our cells are um, regenerating every single cell in our body is regenerating every seven years. And so you got to have a plan. Um, I think this is another challenge within the yoga community where a lot of folks think that because we do this yoga, because we do this mindfulness, that we're not going to age like, like normal people. And maybe there's some level of truth to that, um, that certainly this practice, if it is really truly to benefit our lives, will, um, create an improvement in like how we, in the stages of our lives and how we age. But that is that thought that somehow I am immune to, um, to heart attacks, somehow I am immune to strokes, somehow I'm immune to, to Parkinson's or any of these conditions just because I drink green smoothies or because I practice yoga or mindfulness. Like that is, that is one of the highest levels of arrogance. It's really just, um, a very, very limited self-concept. So I think we have to plan for aging. We have to plan for uh, kind of not being able to do vinyasa or rocket yoga for the rest of our lives. We have to plan to develop a real true love for how we're showing up on this day, which Monday might feel different from Tuesday. Tuesday might feel different from Wednesday. So I sometimes joke when I'm teaching like, hey guys, you're in a level two low class right now. Um, if you're feeling a little more level one today, then, you know, that's pretty normal. Sometimes I'm feeling level zero. And, you know, it, it will be different days of the week, days of the month. Seasonally, it will be different as we age. This is, There's some really profound wisdom that comes from Ayurveda around this, uh, the, what's often called the sister science of yoga, uh, Eastern and Eastern medicine philosophy. But um, I do notice that tendency so frequently where yogis are just shocked that anything bad could happen to them. And as a physical therapist, holy cow, I have worked with a lot of people who have experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of physical trauma or experienced a lot of um, sudden dramatic health shifts, brain aneurysms and strokes, et cetera, et cetera, that were completely unexpected. This includes yogis, not just orthopedic conditions like in our joints or muscles, but like big, huge things. And so we got to stay humble. We got to stay really, really humble, really, really dedicated to the bigger purpose on the mat, which is hopefully this sustainable enhancement of our entire lives. And that literally means that yoga has to evolve. It has to evolve with us. Our physical asana practice has to evolve. Maybe your meditation practice doesn't have, have to evolve, although I would suspect that that probably does too. Um, but for sure, this practice of showing up in the way we use our bodies, this is something that's going to change over the years. And we need to start talking about it really openly. Yes. And, and from personal experience, it has been challenging talking to the, the very dedicated, the teachers that are dedicated to, to their lineage, you know, uh, for example, I have a very dear friend. She's very devoted to to Iyengar, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll try to talk about reading anatomy trains, learning about fascia, and learning about you know just reading various books and and applying the learnings from these books in other other classes I've been taking in my travels. And th this one particular friend, she's like, 
do you need to memorize the structure of bones or are you trying to memorize things or you know and and she pulled up the quote it's one percent theory 99 percent practice i'm probably flipping the quote but 99 percent practice one percent theory just keep practicing and and you'll figure it out that's the only way you'll be able to understand your body and i get where she's coming from but for someone like me who's spent most of my life being really clumsy and having probably this much awareness of my body and only learning maybe in my 34th year of life that my that my left toe is longer than my right i mean i i don't i don't think that kind of approach will work for me or for any of you that are watching that feel like you know you don't have yet have that body awareness and you know, as we practice yoga, we practice other parts of um, taking care of ourselves. Um, sometimes we need that guidance and that information that can help direct us in the safer direction. This might be a really good time to bring up a related thing. So I know we haven't gotten that deep into what I mean by do we serve the poses versus the poses serving us. But I'm going to go off on a, a little side tangent anyway, which is that alignment is not all it's cracked up to be. So again, potentially a little <laughs> controversial. <laughs> um, but what I mean by that is like, is, is that, so I mentor yoga teachers, I mentor yoga teachers and yoga practitioners in this program through yoganatomyacademy.com. And I will often get questions from uh, like students, retreaters who come abroad with me who are like, well, what's the exact angle that the back foot should be at in warrior one? And it is, um, it that conversation actually is not terribly helpful for this bigger picture of our lives, that long-term sustainability of the yoga practice. So somebody's gonna be thinking, listening to this, like, well, actually it is really helpful because if you get the wrong angle, you're jack up your knee. Well. Let me put it another way. So to go back to what I mean by, um, and by the way, <laughs> this is again a side note within a side note, but I'm I'm standing here, I'm not sitting. And this is another way that we can really build more function into our lives. You don't have to invest in a standing desk. You can literally just get a like a lap desk and some boxes and put it up on your dining room table, which is exactly what I have done right here, um, just to keep us in like more functional movement, building strength, building our bone strength. Um, and the sooner you start, the better. So back to this question. So are the poses serving us or do we serve the poses? Well, in real life, there will never be an instance without the practice of yoga on the mat where you take on the form of warrior one without somebody instructing you into it. Like literally, that's just never going to happen. There's a million different ways in which you could lunge in life. Um, like jumping over a puddle, uh, stepping up onto a tall step, um, side lunges, you know, over to get on and off a bike, um, or like catching yourself if you slip, but you're never gonna take on this precise shape of exactly where your back foot is in warrior one. So really the most fundamental thing, and this is gonna change person to person, is finding a place that is natural and comfortable for you. We can, we can suspend the science and suspend this idea of like analyzing everything for a moment. I think this is perfectly valid and perfectly delightful to really remember that there, there's a mystery out there that if we ever start to think that we know everything, we're gonna be very deeply disappointing ourselves. So one of my 10 principles of anatomy informed yoga, my last principle is, um, is to be in the mystery, to allow for there to be mystery. So let's take that back to the yoga mat. Let's um, presume that there is a sacred quality to some of these shapes that we take on on the yoga mat, that there's a, a sacred geometry to these shapes. And so I'm just gonna presume that to be the case about warrior one. Now, working in the direction of that sacred geometry, sure, that's a beautiful thing, but if you start to emphasize front knee has to be at 90 degrees, um, back toes have to turn out 
45 degrees precisely, pelvis has to square to the front of the mat, you're actually going against your most people's basic anatomic structure. You know what I mean? So particularly the, the thing about the pelvis in Warrior One, uh, unless you have very, very shallow hip sockets, which is called hip dysplasia, it's a uh, problem that you don't want to have uh, if you plan to live beyond age 40 or 35, right? You don't want to have this problem. And so if you're constantly forcing your pelvis to square to the front of the mat for warrior one, you're going to cause problems in your hips. You're going to cause problems in your back knee. Um, and especially if you're dropping down to 90 degrees, like it's just not that functional of a shape. So what do I mean by functional? Functional movement is like I mentioned earlier, being able to get on and off the floor without using your hands, being able to uh, jump and leap, being able to crawl, being able to move across the floor on your belly if you needed to, being able to roll, being able to run and walk and sidestep um, and somersault. Like these are all functional movements that in any given circumstance, our ancestors would have had to do like just 150, 200 years ago, some point in their lives. And, um, and so what we're doing sometimes on the yoga mat is we're building strength within this really, really narrow scope, repeating poses. Like I cannot tell you the last time I went to a class that wasn't labeled gentle where there, where there was not a vinyasa. Actually, I'll give a shout out to somebody right now. Um, some of the festival teachers have figured out that that the students can't handle vinyasa that much. So some of my friends, MC Yogi and his wife, Amanda, they'll teach and they'll teach classes where they, at least in the first 30 minutes or so, avoid vinyasa entirely. And that's a beautiful thing because they're at these festivals where people have done four classes a day for three or four days in a row. And so they're, they're, you can really pick up some gems from, from some of those experts. Um, but yeah, like, what we're doing on the yoga mat, even though there's a tremendous diversity within uh, the lineage of yoga, we are often really in this narrow scope of movement and really kind of like OCD about certain things. And different bodies present different ways. So for example, my boyfriend, his shin bone on the right side is externally rotated relative to his femur. So the way that his right foot lands on the floor in Warrior One, is gonna be different than the way his left foot lands on the floor in Warrior One. And every one of us, we have quirks like this in our body. So it's a that's what I mean when I say like alignment is not the end all be all. Alignment is really not all it's caught up to be. And um, what I would encourage, what I would hope your friend who is a huge fan of Iyengar also can wrap her mind around um, because Iyengar yoga is a beautiful thing. If that's your lineage, that's amazing. Um, and there's a lot of gems of wisdom in it. Uh, what she can wrap her mind around is the fact that Iyengar as a lineage really evolved quite a bit over, you know, I am BKS Iyengar's lifetime. And also really um, doesn't, doesn't have to contradict things like walking, brisk walking, hiking, um, the capacity to go up and down stairs or to run or to swim. So she can find some ways to uh, incorporate some complementary movements that maybe don't feel like they are um, in contradiction to her studies as a student of Iyengar. Yeah, I, I, I should add that she's gone into Ashtanga. So, you know, it's, oh. <laughs> which might be a little controversial in, in and of itself, but I, I think it's great for, for people to try out the different styles of yoga and to take, like I say, take what works and, and leave what doesn't and be able to take the, the little gems, as you say, from, from every, every teacher we come across. Um, and I know that the, one of the models on uh, Yoga Anatomy Academy is that there's no, there's no shaming of any particular pose. There's no, uh, you know, sticking to just one style. And I, I love that because what that does is it has people think about 
how they can approach the practice in a well-rounded manner instead of blaming the pose and taking a look at, okay, so maybe I need more chest and shoulder strength to do wild thing, or maybe I need more strength in the lower back region to be able to to come up from a forward fold. I even, uh, I even wrote a blog post called The Problem is Never the Pose. I read it, yes. I, I read yeah. several of your blog posts and I think it was oh, amazing. Thank you for reading. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally love learning from, from other teachers who just walk the, walk the, walk the walk, pave the way before me. And um, it was interesting because I read your blog post after I had posted a question on Instagram. I post these questions that inspire thought and discussion and very um, supportive discussion between teachers and students, and I had posted the uh, question, is wild thing harming or, or helping you, helping your shoulders? And there was, there was really supportive talk. No one, no one was bashing each other in any way. They were very open about how wild thing was great for them and how some other students said, wild things never felt good on the mat, and maybe I should stop practicing it. And, um, you know, and after reading your blog post, I was like, hmm, yeah, I definitely did not mean to have some people stop doing wafting forever, but to really think about what is what is it that they need to do to balance out their practice so that wild thing doesn't feel so funny, you know? And I'm doing a chicken wing for some reason now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so one of the exercises we often, well, I don't know about often, but I think a really solid exercise to, to improve someone's shoulder stability after an injury uh, that many physical therapists will give to their patients is called the Turkish get up. And so it's kind of a weightlifting move where you start off on your back, you roll to your side, you end up first on your elbow, kind of like a side forearm plank, and then you um, push up to just your hand like you're starting to go into a side plank, but your legs aren't straight yet. And the idea of the Turkish getup is that it's a way to get on and off the floor carrying a, ultimately like a, a big weight, a big kettlebell. And if you break it down, there's a stage of the Turkish getup that's not terribly different from wild thing. So you can use these poses as part of your medicine, or you can use these poses as part of your poison really and wild thing will be poisonous if you don't do the self-inquiry if you don't um, show up with an awareness of where you're hypermobile so uh, kind of an extreme example but somebody who has dis dislocated a shoulder you go to a vinyasa yoga class and it's just like hey try wild thing and you're just like okay this is my third yoga class i'll try it and you go into it i mean you could genuinely dislocate your shoulder uh, a second time um on the other hand someone who has a dislocated shoulder i could basically break down wild thing into its component parts and that could be the medicine that stabilizes their shoulder um, which would then theoretically ultimately allow them to have wild thing within their practice yeah um, just a couple of quick explanations. Maybe we should post with the show notes, if you do such things, a uh, picture of wild things so people know what we're talking about. And, um, and maybe we should um, explain, you mentioned earlier the anatomy trains, Tom Myers and fascia. Yeah. And so just to give people a heads up what that is, I meant to say this earlier, but anatomy trains is this, I, this uh, theory that has been developed, I believe by more than one person, but Tom Myers is quite famous for it, that there are these lines of connective tissue in the body that are outside the bounds of what we know of from Western, uh, well, from anywhere in the world, as far as I know, um, uh, dissection. So when I was spending those eight weeks, four hours a day dissecting a human body, we did not look at fascia. I mean, I just hate, I hate to say it. And, and that was not that long ago. That was less than 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, barely less than 10 years ago, but a little bit less than 10 years ago. And we, you know, we, um, we just cut through it. 
and separated muscle, separated tendon, separated, you know, bone, of course, and nerves and anything else other than fascia, really. So fascia is this substance that's sort of been historically seen as like between the rest of the stuff. And there are some schools of thought that are really exploring its actual function, how it shows up in our in our day-to-day -day lives and can either be tensioned in these different patterns or released, or how, how it really serves like almost like a scaffolding for the body. Um, so it's a pretty cool emerging field of anatomy science, but it's not well recognized historically through um, through Western medicine. And it's actually not very well addressed, even I think in, in any style of yoga, some people will say that yin yoga gets to the fascial layer. And I think that's true to some extent, but it's not actually developing healthy fascia. So the development of healthy fascia requires um, bounce, like literally like plyometrics, which we don't do in yoga. Maybe we mm. occasionally do it. Would we like jump back to chaturanga or jump forward or something like that it has a plyometric component to it, but we're really not doing much plyometrics on the mat. Um, and we need that kind of balance, that like uh, impact to, to create a new fascial, a healthy fascial network. So just more common sense, basic exercise science and basic current anatomy knowledge to reinforce the idea that we need something other than yoga off the mat to serve our lives, our longevity, our sustainability. And that can include sustainability on the yoga mat. Yeah, for sure. So we have just about six minutes left. And I wanted to see if there was uh, any main takeaways that you would like to have the audience uh, think about upon watching uh, the end of this video area. Sure. Well, I guess the takeaway is just to start thinking creatively about how yoga shows up in your life, um, your physical asana practice, whether there are things that you can, you might have been ignoring, little aches and pains or nags that you might have been ignoring, um, whether alignment cues are really serving you and whether these poses are really functional in your life. Um, and how we can still be playful and experiment and try hard things on the yoga mat. But remember the underlying principle that we're there for the long haul, that we're there to um, really up-level our lives. And yeah. And it can be a fun, delightful thing. Um, so another thing, I am going to give everybody who watches this access to um, to this that ten principles of anatomy informed yoga. Like I made a little PDF and all that, so it's a oh, nice cool. downloadable thing with these ten points. And I didn't want to go over the ten points on this conversation because I actually went over it really recently on a podcast that you guys should listen to. It's called The Connected Yoga Teacher with Shannon Crow. And I just talk about the 10 principles of anatomy-informed yoga on there. So I didn't want to be repetitive. I wanted to come up with something new. And um, But I'll still give you guys access to that because I think it's a really great compliment to this, this conversation of um, are we doing the poses or the poses doing us? And, and it changes the framework. Like what, we're, what Julie and I are talking about today, if you're watching this still at this hour, is that, um, that yoga can evolve and that yoga maybe should evolve, right? Like as we learn more about ourselves, as we as individual practitioners age, as we um, start to understand more about the history of yoga and as we start to understand more about like from science about our bodies that hopefully we are in a receptive place where we can really apply this new stuff to the mat and um in the meanwhile while it's evolving just staying creative try not to be too repetitive um think about uh ways this this could be a whole other conversation but think about ways to if, if a pose 
really is outside of your realm right now, whether it's chaturanga, handstand, wild thing. Think about ways that you can step it down. And by that, I mean, like, if you went to the gym, you'd start with 10 pounds lifting, and then you'd go to 20 and 30 and 40. And we can, as yoga teachers, start to think more creatively about how to up-level someone's strength in order to maybe eventually do a pose versus just do this pose 27 times, therefore, you'll build the strength for it. Those are my main takeaways, <laughs> I think. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to send you the link to Lee, and it would be delightful if you could put it under this, um, under this, uh, this wherever you you store this video. Thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely send the the podcast link to everyone through the email because I know we have a couple couple of West Coasters that could not wake up this early on a Sunday morning to join, but they really wanted to be able to listen to the conversation. So I'll be sending the replay link of the video and I'll send the podcast link. And for those of you that are watching this later, you can check out Ariel's Yoga Anatomy Academy site as well. There's two buttons underneath this video. And uh, it's, it's the box, the teal green box on the right. And for those of you that would love to take a wellness slash yoga retreat. I'm leading one in Bali next July, and I will actually be teaching a more well-rounded, uh, let's call it like a yoga buffet. Like I will be covering fascial conditioning and some yin, as well as some strength training, and as well as some of the, the yoga flows themselves. So, uh, but, in any rate, thank you guys for watching. Um, thanks for watching the replay. And thank you, Ariel, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. I mean, <laughs> you have a very full plate and your your plate is full of, of love and care for other people and their health and their well-being. So um, really, really uh, thankful that you got to, to share your golden nuggets with us. Thanks for having me, Julie. I wish I could be in Santorini with you. <laughs> for anyone who wants more information about Yoga Anatomy Academy, it's literally yoganatomyacademy.com. And I also run retreats, not as many as Julie, but I am running a retreat to Guatemala January 28th to February 3rd, 2018. This place is super magical. A lot of functional movement just to get around because there's lots of steps. Um, and of course, I'll be applying all these strength principles and like intelligent meditative meditation motion principles. And it's just magical. So that can be found over at sacredsourceyoga.com. Thank you again, Julie. Such a Thank treat you. to be here. Thank you, everyone. See you at the next Science Yoga Sunday. Peace. <laughs>